I'm sorry, we can't uh, hold any official business, but we're gonna, we have our uh, community leaders and uh, our uh, uh, guest speaker, Sylvia Lackey, is on his way. So he should be here shortly. Uh, I've got a call on the way down here. So if we can stand uh, for the pledge. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ooh. We'll set, uh, we have public comments. Does anybody have any public comments on anything in general? No? All right, so we'll start our community leaders. We'll start with the Kern County Sheriff's. Ooh, start it off. <laughs> start us <laughs> off. Uh, my name is Senior Deputy Giorgio. I'm uh, the Senior Deputy down here in Roseman. Um, I have some stats. Uh, it seems like our Grand Theft Auto is still one of our leading um, theft reports that are going on. We had 15 uh, investigations last month and then four actual um, other reports of uh, stolen vehicles that were in progress at the time that they were dispatched to it. Um, I'll go over, so what we call code six is pretty much on-site activity. We had 66 of those and then uh, traffic stops, we had uh, 58 of those. Um, including about 96 patrol checks. So a lot of that is our, our deputies going out there and trying to be proactive in, in the community and trying to find um, activity before it becomes a problem. Um, and then in total, we had 588 calls last month um, and then 240 of those were officer initiated activities. Um, we did hold a, um, a project in August. I don't know if it was spoke about uh, at the last meeting um, basically, it was a project that I put on for um, overtime deputies to come in. We had deputies come in from mostly our area and then some from the Bakersfield area. And it was a, a project that we put on to go out and try to contact people at homeless encampments and see if anybody had warrants and try to get rid of some of the riffraff that has been going on around here. Um, through that, we had 13 arrests. Uh, seven of those were felony arrests, um, including guns and narcotics. And then we also uh, issued eight citations. And I want to say we towed approximately four cars just driving on the road being expired and no insurance from the uh, non-registered drivers. So that was our project in the uh, August month. Okay. I'm just curious, uh, do you have any idea what year make and models have been uh, targeted for theft? For theft? Uh, a lot of this area is um, the Kias, Hondas, and Chevy pickup trucks. We have a local person in the area that loves to steal Chevy trucks. Uh, not only do they come from out here, but they also go down to LA County and bring them up out here. Are they the older models? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. Usually, typically uh, later 90s to early 2000s. Yeah. Easy to steal. Yes. Did uh, coaches have a, a break in uh, Tuesday morning? I, when I was coming, I was leaving real early, I saw several of your units and it looked like a, a convergen, convergence on coaches. Very early Tuesday morning? Yeah, about seven o'clock in the morning. I know they had an audible alarm oh, okay. there. I don't know what the outcome of that was though. Gotcha. Well, they got broke the window. What's that? There's a board in one of the windows now. Oh, uh, so I'm guessing so. Gotcha. Yeah. Any, any update on the, uh, the move-in progress of uh, the temporary setup? No. <laughs> um, from what I was told is possibly late December, um, maybe into early next year. It was supposed to be done a couple months ago, but I guess they ran into some hiccups. Um, and then they're also talking about trying to separate our subs again, instead of making us one super sub where we're combined with Patch B, Mojave, and Boron. Um, they're talking about separating subs where we're individually, whoever's assigned to Roseman, we stay in Roseman and we patrol Roseman instead of bouncing back and forth. Um, that should hopefully come pretty soon here. I heard late December, um, possibly April, um, as people come through the field training program. Perfect, that's awesome. Will you be in charge of Rosen? As a senior deputy, uh -huh. um, but not the sergeant, that's Sergeant Joe. Perfect, guys. All right. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. California Hydro, Aaron. All right. Uh, so, give me a little update first on the little broader spectrum of the department as a, as a whole. Um, so we just got uh, some new information. Uh, we're pushing uh, uh, approximately 160 cadets through our academy. Uh, about every, 
approximately every 10 weeks or so. So we're pushing a lot of cadets through, which should eventually filter down uh, to the field offices, something new that we're starting, well, not new that we're starting, but um, this frequency um, right now and then pushing into next year. So uh, hopefully we're gonna continue to see more results and see more officers from the CHP, not only here, but throughout California. Um, applications to the department uh, are up substantially compared to especially two years ago. Um, so that's good news. Uh, so as a department update, that's kind of where we're at as an area. Um, I know we've had a lot of DUI arrests down here. In fact, one we've been, our officers have been looking for one uh, white stand in particular that I guess has been doing burnouts around the city late at night. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time we get called to it, by the time we get down here, you know, it's gone. When the officers try to uh, stage in the area and be proactive, it doesn't show up. <laughs> so, uh, but we're working on it. Um, but in fact, while looking for that vehicle, I guess the other night, they found another vehicle um, doing the exact same thing. So they made an arrest on that because that driver was impaired. So um, it helped. Uh, but we're still looking, all I know is it's a white sedan in here. I don't have a license plate or anything like that, but I guess the white sedan's been going around at night doing burnouts in the intersections. Um, so we're actively working on that. Um, we've also been working a lot of traffic complaints and a lot of expired registration complaints on parked vehicles. Um, it takes time, but our officers do get around to it. I know you submitted a whole bunch, and in fact today he was down here again, still working on that list, towing another couple vehicles from the Rosemond area um, for the registration. So <coughs> it takes time because everything is just done in between calls and um, you know doing paperwork associated with the calls. Uh, but uh, we're, we're progressing our way through it. Question: Is the Highway Patrol down a thousand people? Is that right? Uh, we still have we still just uh, we still have a lot of vacancies. I'll put it that way. Not not a thousand anymore. We've been working on that. That was our slogan a couple years ago. Um, well, we've hired uh, probably that many people. We've also lost a lot of people through retirements, injuries, and and uh, uh, just moving on to other departments, uh, resigning. So. Uh, we're still trying to push as many people as we can through our academy and, and get more officers on the road because uh, they understand, you know, it's not just Roseman, you know, it's everywhere it needs to see more people and more proactive enforcement. And the more people we can get on the road, you know, the less time we're, we're individually working on paperwork and, and calls for service. So what percentage the more time we can do, be proactive. I'm sorry. I was curious what percentage of attrition do you have every year? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have that. Yeah, it's it's kind of a little bit of a lengthy process. We can talk about it later if you're interested, but uh, I already can. got an application. Okay, very good. Question. Yes, you know the crosswalk that is by Taco Bell and the school district office that goes across the other side? Have we had any incidents there? I know there's been accidents because I've witnessed mm -hmm. two myself, and then just two days ago. I stopped because it was around four in the afternoon and there was a student crossing and this is after hours for a crossing guard. Sure. She pressed the thing, she's walking and cars are flying through there to the point where one almost hit her mm -hmm. and I had to like honk to try to get their attention as they're coming flying up on this side of me. It's clear so they can see. Right. So I know there's a process to go through for stop signs and things like that, but I'm wondering if you know anything about that particular spot. I'm not familiar with any particular instance, not to say that they haven't happened, I just don't know, you know, crashes, they get written and recorded and, and completed, you know, a lot of times without having any knowledge of them, but something I can look into. As far as getting a stop sign or a traffic signal installed there, that's gonna be through the county. Uh, but I'll bring it back and let, let our uh, uh, guys know, work it up as a traffic complaint and, and see if we can't get someone to, to go out there a little bit. So spend some time, yeah. It's scary because the kids cross there constantly going to Starbucks definitely take note of that and I'll bring it back and see if we can't uh, send some people out here to come help with that. So, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Turn it over to our illustrious Assemblyman Lackey, your guest speaker. <laughs> we're all illustrious about this, but hey, <laughs> happy to be here. Just so everybody knows, it's been a while. They've had a chance to come and spend some time with you. I've had to uh, bail out a couple times uh, because of conflicts. You probably don't even know that, but it's fact. But I will tell you that um, I missed an Olympics meeting tonight <laughs> from out in LA, so that would have been a lot of fun, but I wasn't gonna blow you off third time. So 
Happy to be here. I don't have great news uh, because I work for the state. And <laughs> there's a lot of things that are happening that um, I wish were not happening, in all truth. And it could be worse. I wish it was better, and many of us are fighting to make it better. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that uh, are happening, some of the things that uh, didn't happen that we fought for, and so we'll fight again. What normally happens at the state level has been my experience. This is my 10th year, if you can believe that. Um, I remember standing here with Steve Fox uh, at the big debate, and it seems like it wasn't that long ago, but uh, time does fly. And it's been a great experience. I've learned a great deal about people. And uh, a lot of really good people that I get to work with that are elected people, but they sure have had different life experiences and they see things a lot differently. And you know, we need to not hate on those people. We need to just try to work with them and help be good influences on them. Like in my lifetime, I've had really good influencers. I really have. I'm very thankful for that because I could tell that other people have not had those influencers. And so they have different views. And so we gotta work on that because some of the people that uh, are making the decisions need more influencers. And people like us that live out here in less populated areas, they're not used to their influence. They're not used to hearing what they have to say. And their, their concerns are a little different than ours. So it's been quite a learning experience and it's fun to keep trying to make headway. And I, I really do feel like this whole uh, legislative experience, they've changed because of the new district boundaries. Um, my, most of my area now is San Bernardino County, about 62% of it. I go all the way to Nevada border. I, and I have 29 Palms, which is also a long ways away. Uh, and then I go all the parts of Interstate 5. Yeah. So it's a big swath. Uh, it's a lot of territory and a lot of small towns. And I have the mountains. I have Big Bear. I have Little uh, Big, Big Bear Lake, Lake Arrowhead, Rim of the World, all that whole mountain range all the way down into Highland. Um, it's an enormous area. And I get to deal with small communities, which I'm very familiar with because I grew up in one. So I know our, our situations. I know our problems. Insurance is an absolute mess. Um, I don't know that we have any good news to report there. Um, we're trying to manage it. We're trying to address these. Uh, what's happening is because of these enormous fires, um, companies are losing money and so they're just leaving. And what's happening is that uh, competition drives prices up. When there's less competition, there's more demand and that's bad for the consumer. And that's what we what we've developed into, and I think some of it was preventable, but that ship has sailed. That toothpaste has squirted out. So there ain't no sense of trying to get it back in the tube. It ain't gonna work. So we're gonna try to have to work with what we've got. And I don't think it's a complete calamity, but it's pretty darn close. Um, I don't know. Luckily, none of you live in the mountains. The mountains are the, is the worst. Uh, there's people that their, their rates went 10 times what they were. And that's just really not affordable for a lot of people. And you gotta have the homeowner's insurance uh, in order to satisfy your loan. So a lot of people have to foreclose, it's really bad. And so we're trying to remedy that, at least find some, <laughs> some band-aids so that people can survive it until we can get more competition back in the state. Um, you might be aware of the fact that uh, the legislature was just called back into some emergency session. <sighs> And I, I don't mind going back for an emergency session if there's something valuable to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it was the governor's approach to go after the uh, oil industry. Uh, he hates them uh, for a lot of reasons. And I, I wish you would understand that we use oil a lot more than just for fuel. We use it for many things. We're gonna have to have, our, our society demands oil. It demands it. So we either take it from our ground or we buy it from elsewhere, usually countries that really don't love us. And so it's also dirtier. They claim that they're worried about environmental concerns. Well, it's world concerns. It's a lot dirtier than we're buying. And so logically, it really doesn't fit, but it's a practice. And so many of us are trying to push back. 
And what uh, reason why we had to get back together, I can give you a bunch of the numbers, you don't care. I, I, if I was you, I wouldn't care either. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's fundamentally flawed. His own people are telling him, he, the reason why he's doing this, he's, he's requiring refineries to have extra fuel, not oil, fuel. There's a difference because of the way you store it and exactly what it is, it makes a difference. Um, and he's requiring these refineries to uh, store extra fuel to keep what he claims is to keep spikes from happening. Because every once in a while, a, a refinery will go down and the price spikes. And that's because we have so few refineries because he's punishing oil. And no one really wants to hang around here if your future is being rubbed out. As a matter of fact, after this legislation passed, we've already had one saying they're bailing out. We only have nine in the whole state. And so what it's 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 not that hard. I'm not an economics major, but it's supply and demand, guys. And when you interfere with the flow of supply and demand, you're making a mistake. Because anytime you create, we, we saw it in the 70s, how they tried to control prices and they said that there was a fuel shortage and so they tried to get involved and we saw the big lines on, most of you are old enough to know or remember those days, but I do. Um, and we had a real crisis for several years. Well, I, I worry that some of these decisions like this particular decision is gonna backfire. And because it interferes with the flow and our ability to generate our own uh, fuel um, because of these demands that the, the companies have indicated they're in no position to accomplish. Right. And he's providing no funding to accomplish this. And so it's on their dime. So guess whose dime it'll really be? Yes. It'll be us. Yes. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't think gas is cheap already. And I got some more bad news for you. I just found out today that CARB, which is the California Air Resources Board, they have as much, if not more, power than the state legislature, and they have no accountability to anybody because they're appointed people. And they're real, they're about ready to impose, hold on to your hats, 60 cent gallon increase that may take place within weeks. And I'm, I'm telling you folks, this is bad stuff. And it's all under the umbrella of investing in our environment. Well, we're part of the environment, right? And, and so why aren't we considered in this green standard? Um, because the green that matters to me is what's in my wallet or what's not in my wallet. And I'm telling you, it's, uh, I'm all for clean water and clean air, but we've got to do it in a measured way that the regular people are not gonna get punished. And I feel like there's, they're, they're punishing rural people uh, because we don't drive out of convenience, we drive out of necessity. And it's a completely different standard. They don't, public transportation is not available to our people that are struggling. It's not available out here. Do you guys have much public transportation here in Roseland? I know they don't have it in Boron, which is where I grew up. It's, that's what I'm telling you. They don't have rural mentality and they really just kind of blow us off because there's not enough of us. That's bad. That's a bad, that's not a democratic process, in my opinion. And so I'm just telling you that honesty, right? I, it isn't that I hate Democrats because I'm only elected because of Democrats. I had to have a, a significant number of Democrats vote for me or I, I represented a Democratic district for eight years by a significant margin, by the biggest margin of any Republican. So I don't, I don't hate people because of their party reference. I just hate people that don't take us into consideration. I don't hate anybody, but I get frustrated that they won't listen. They don't, they say that they have hearts for people that are struggling if they live near them, but if they live out here, we're not really in that circle. That's wrong. That's wrong, and we're gonna continue to battle and make public some of these uh, unfair circumstances. I also had well, I, did, I do have one good piece. I get to go speak to Congress, which is a gift of my life. I never thought I would ever have a chance to speak to Congress. And I'm going up to speak about the high-speed rail. 
And boy, am I excited to do that. Because you know what? Back in 2010, I supported it. Because it made sense at that time. It made sense because the numbers that they gave us seemed realistic. And they, they indicated that we were going to have private industry, we were going to have the state, and we were going to have the federal government divide it up three ways on, on the cost. And we were, it was going to be evolutionary. It was going to transition. It was going to help this valley because we we're going to have more commerce. We we're going to have more influence. We we're going to have more good things happen. But then government did, did what it always does too often in that it overestimated the partnership we got because of the design and because of the coordination of this whole project no private investor would invest zero not even one zero private investment okay and then guess what once the federal government saw that there was no private investment they said woohoo we're not going to give you a big bunch of money to a project that doesn't pencil out right. and so and guess what else has happened the cost of goods has spiraled up, and the cost of labor has spiraled up. Um, what was supposed to cost 30 billion with a B is now like 120 some billion. And uh, we've already invested over 30 billion to this date. I mean, this was 2010 that we passed, and we've been giving money, 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 money to this project. And right now, it's just shy of Fresno to Bakersfield. And, but they have not, even at that cost, we're, we're in the hole about another 40 billion to finish from Fresno to Bakersfield. That's the goal right now. It's a money loser and it's, it's our bridge to nowhere. It's a terrible investment, except if you're in the project, right, it's work. So you got construction people that are supporting this because it's giving them work. So I don't blame them for wanting to, to support it, but I'm telling you, for the rest of us, we could use the money elsewhere, right? We've got a lot of other challenges that uh, this transportation hub is not even close to what it was projected to be. Now, if you don't know, there, there's, there's a process that anytime you have a project like that, that if you have cost, overruns are called a change order. And when any, every time you have a change order, that means that it's unexpected cost for this project that you've approved. And so there's a process in, in evaluating and saying, okay, we'll bite the bullet. We're, we're, we'll accept this change and this, this change order. Well, in the past, there's been no one looking over these change orders that are being submitted over and over and over again. And these cost overruns have been Ridiculous. So I propose, and the governor just signed into law just a few weeks ago, that any change order that now is over $100 million has to be evaluated and has to be publicly disclosed. Well, I do care because I uh, can't answer that. Phone. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so at least we got some transparency now over the project. Anything over $100 billion. Uh, and a change order has to be evaluated publicly disclosed. That's how crazy th this whole project is, folks. We, we don't have money to uh, do certain things, but we seem to have plenty of money for other things because the public agreed to it back in 2010. That money, that whole commitment ends in 2030, which is not that far away. And we'll see what happens then. But I have a feeling that uh, it's going to get approved at least from, uh, from Fresno to Bakersfield. So if you guys want to enjoy <laughs> an electric ride, go visit your county seat. Um, that's my report on, on that situation. And finally, I had a piece of legislation uh, for the Bobcat Fire. All victims of the Bobcat Fire, that was 115,000 acres that roasted. And a lot of people's Residents, a lot of people's property um, became a casualty to that fire. And so what happens is now, under current law, when you receive compensation for uh, settlement money, um, that money, that restoration money is taxed. And I'm thinking, 
for other fires they've given relief. It's time that we give relief. This is restoration, but this is not their uh, fun money, vacation money. This is to uh, repair damage that's been done. So why in the world does the state feel like they're entitled to any of that money? Well, guess what? When it went through the review process, on the assembly side to the committee, it was completely unanimously supported. Everybody said that's fair. When it went through the Senate side, everybody unanimously said, we believe that that's a great idea. That needs to happen. But it got to the governor's desk and guess what happened? I'm so sorry, this is a deficit year. Veto. So we have to bring that one back. We're gonna bring it back again and again and again until it passes. But uh, unfortunately it didn't make it this time around. Um, I wish that's better news. I don't know what else to say. What's good news? <laughs> Prop 36 wasn't up there. It was like that is good news. Yeah. I think the last polling I saw was uh, upper 60s, up, up for 60 percent. So, and in case you don't know, Prop, does everybody know what Prop 36 is? It has to do with uh, public safety, and most importantly, I don't know if you're aware. But they just recently, and I was on KFI this morning, um, talking about this issue. We had somebody that was uh, convicted federally from Lancaster um, that was involved in a drug operation involving drones. And fentanyl was part of the, uh, one of the uh, drugs being peddled. And there's actually a death involved at least one death that we know of associated with this whole transaction. And these, uh, these drones are actually being operated through a receiver in a church parking lot. So these people are very smart and they know what they're doing. This, this is not drug dealers of the past that were just people that were on hard times trying to survive. These are white collar criminals that are calculating and be killing people. Fentanyl is a killer, it's a poison. And most of these fentanyl deaths are from people that don't even know they're ingesting fentanyl. Yeah. And so it's a poison in my opinion, they call them overdoses, which I think is an unfair characterization. Uh, because overdose people are, are people that are addicted to a drug that uh, overdo it. And that's not what's happening. These are people, unsuspecting victims um, that are getting killed. And it's all parts of our society it's all races, all parts of our social strata that are becoming victimized. And we better figure this out as a society because public safety should be a priority of the government. That's one of the things that people expect when they pay taxes that they'll be protected. And right now we're not as strong as we need to be in protecting our people against um, this fentanyl crisis. It's a very serious problem and it's, it's hit locally. Uh, Lancaster is pretty darn close, everybody. And if you don't think it's not happening out here, you're mistaken. It's happening everywhere. And we just, uh, law enforcement is, is doing its best, but uh, we also need tools, and that's what Prop 36 will now address some penalties. Because right now, um, it's really sad. We, we took Prop 47 because of some mistakes, the way we were enforcing drug laws was a little over heavy handed, it was. But unfortunately, this is an overreaction because now we said all drug circumstances are going to be dealt with at a misdemeanor level and some of these drug circumstances need punishment. Because yeah. these, these people have no fear of any kind of uh, incarceration, any kind of uh, consequences. We need to tighten that up. And Prop 36 helps tighten that up. Uh, it's very thoughtful. It's not heavy-handed. It's, uh, it's supported through bipartisan support. And please don't miss out on your opportunity to help correct some of the mistakes we've made in the past. That's my opinion, very, and I'll be willing to debate anybody in here that wants to debate me. Um, one of the issues we're having up here, uh, Assemblyman, is we're, we're fighting a, a violent sexual predator <coughs> they're wanting to release into our community. And it's a third party, basically. We just got wage. Mr. Hubbard. I don't know if you know about him, the pillowcase. Yeah, rapist. I heard about that. But so we have, I, I fought against that too. I mean, I wrote my letters. I did everything. I've even testified in SVP hearings and I fell on deaf ears. The process is not easy, but 
you should still get engaged because every once in a while you can stop it. Yeah, one, one of the things where my heartache is is United Health. They're basically hiring a warm body to, to do the monitoring with no law enforcement experience or anything like that. Could there be some legislation to where if we have a violent sexual predator coming into the community, the state has to have their people, train people, monitor him instead of a you know person who really has no experience to supply for the job online? And <laughs> I mean, we could sure try. I, I don't know that that would be that all that receptive because they feel like in order to really change the vendor, you, you would actually have to have somebody that really feels something other than compassion, right? And, and compassion is, impo is a, an important trait to have. However, it has to be also considering the threat, right? And I think sometimes that's really dismissed way too easily. And especially with the sexually violent predator, it's a unique problem. And they should, they do know that, but uh, the way they manage it is very questionable. Very and, and especially from my perspective, and anybody that has a child should have that same perspective because some, especially like this Mr. Hubbard that we just had released, we know of at least 40 cases, 40, and he, he violated his previous uh, placement out here, yet he's coming back. What in the world is that? Um, so it's a very, very steep climb is what I'm trying to say. You don't, you don't just give up, so we're, we'll keep pushing. I don't know what form of legislation we're going to take. I've only got two years left, so we'll see what's gonna happen, but there's so many problems. Another really big problem is our uh, DCFS has got their hands full, and I think they're way overburdened. It's not completely their fault, um, but they, we've got to figure this out. We have children that are dying um, here locally too routinely. And so I've, I've been trying legislation every year I've been in office. And uh, it's very complicated. We get almost to the finish line and something bad happens. But uh, we're gonna keep that battle up too because people that uh, are in homes through no fault of their own because their parents have eroded somewhere or having trouble, the kids have become victims and the likelihood of those kids having trouble in the future is very high if we don't fix this. That's not fair. What do you think the solution is, would be? Who said that? I did. What do I think the solution? Number one, I'll tell you, the first thing that needs to happen is the state needs to fund professional training of people that are in those systems. They're under, each person that's in DCFS goes at the front line, they have like 80 cases each. That's, that's not doable for anybody. And that's first priority is we need to change that. And we have, it costs money. Everything costs money. So it's a competition for the dollar. And I just can tell you that there's a lot of competition and it's a lot of worthy competition. And so it becomes very, very difficult um, to fix this, but when you're talking loss of life for a child, on the priority scale, that seems to be at the very top to me. Uh, it shouldn't be way down where it gets put. And so um, we're gonna continue to fight for it. Because, and that's where it needs to start. And here's the other thing, as we're not even graduating people in that profession at a high, if, if we employed every person that graduated, we would still be short. So it, it has to even, flow into that next layer. That we need to attract, and that means you have to pay salaries, right? And that means you have to attract some of the best people and not just people that are falling into that. So it's it's a long-term solution, truthfully. Yeah. It's not gonna be fixed within the next two years. It's just not. But until we start, we're, we're surrendering to failure and that's not acceptable in my opinion. Yeah, because the reason I ask the question to me is just such a difficult topic have a solution for you. Know? It is difficult, yeah. but that doesn't mean you've waved the white flag and just no. accept status quo, no. right? You gotta, it's an incremental change. It needs to come incrementally. And every step that you take to improve could save a life, could save many lives. And so those children that are caught in that system deserve any effort that we can put forth. And uh, it's an unfortunate reality because I could tell you, in my situation, I had Leave it to Beaver upbringing. Some of you don't even know who I'm talking about. 
Most of you are close to my age, or at least close to know what Leave it to Beaver is. Corbo County glasses. Okay. That's, <laughs> now that's back there. But uh, <laughs> no, nonetheless, I, I had, I really had what I would call the perfect upbringing. I had a stay-at-home mother. I had a, a father that was very active in my life, and I had a mother that was very active in my life, and I didn't know that that was a luxury. I thought that everybody had that to a, a degree that many times was annoying, right? They made me do homework. They made me do things that I didn't like to do. When I say they made me, they they used their influence. And it, it isn't like I got whipped or anything, but uh, there were consequences if I didn't follow up. And so, but not everybody has that kind of investment. And when you don't have that investment, you're likely to wander. That's just human nature. And so we have many wandering people that need help. And we need, as a society, we need to be less judgmental and more helpful in prevention instead of just dealing with consequences. We need to get at the front end of it and try to prevent instead of deal with the, the out outcomes are going to happen. We've got to do that too. But let's put a little stronger effort in the prevention side. And I've been trying to do that since I've been there, and I get pushed back. And it's very frustrating. And I understand the pushback too, right? I mean, a democracy needs both sides to battle. So we get good tempered policy. That's the best. And we need to quit fighting and, and we need to work together. And it's not that hard for me. It's just not. I don't know why people choose to fight. But there are times you have to, what I would call battle, uh, because it's, a, it's extremely immoral extremely offensive uh, but those are rare those are those those battles are rare so right now with this presidential situation we're not at our best everybody we're, we're we don't like some people are not even associating with other people who have different views they don't want to be around them that's very very scary for America that's a bad arrangement um, and it, it goes into faith too I mean people that have different faith or different religion or different anything different uh, they, they just don't want to be around and once we start on that track we're doomed so we, we better do a little better and, and if you're one of those people that alienates other people I ask you to please reconsider and, and be part of helping this country get it back together because we're starting to crumble a little bit and, but we can fix it it's a great country that we're the ones in charge of the problems. If you do nothing but complain about problems, it's part on you. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I still believe in this place. I, I believe in Animal Valley is a great place to live. But we need to all become more involved. I mean, this place should be packed. You should have this place filled with people. Uh, if nothing else, just to learn what's happening. Just to become educated. You don't have to come here to complain. Everybody thinks that they only need to come when it's time to gripe. Well, that is a time to come, but it's not the only time to come. Everybody needs to be engaged. And I was taught that because I was from a small community to be involved. And we had a very active community, but life changes things, man. And it's becoming, we're more self-absorbed than we are team absorbed. And we need to knock that off because we all want the same stuff. We all want to be happy. We all want to just do our lives and, and love on each other, that uh, the people we care about. And I don't know, we're goofing it up. And a lot of it's preventable. A lot of it's because of us. And so be one of those lights, man. It's, it's becoming a little darker, which means your light will shine a little brighter. So it's, it's an opportunity time, is the way I see it. I, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of my associates and friends and family have become very cynical and that's dangerous don't think that you can't make a difference because you can and you must a lot of times you don't see it a lot of the differences that you make you don't know they're incremental but they're they're not evident to you just be a good person just be a good person man it makes a difference and i'm telling you right now it'll be noticed and appreciated not always but most of the time so everybody that's here, you show you care. So I'm thankful. I'm talking to the right people. You guys are the ones that can be the lights to those who uh, need that light. So please do that. Know that I'm in Sacramento, which is what I call a pretty darkened place. It needs a little light. 
And not that I'm all that in a bag of chips, but I am a person that really believes in trying to be helpful. And I, I consider it an honor that I get to go there. I'm a moron, man. Who, who thinks, even from Roseman, that you're ever going to be in the state legislature? I don't come from wealth. I don't. I don't even come from influence. I just happen to know the right people at the right time, and I, I'm here. And I don't even, I can't even tell you how it happened other than it did. A lot of hard work by a lot of other people other than me. And that's how, those are the kind of good things that can happen when everybody works together. But if you fragment and you become self-defeating, then you become part of the problem. So thank you for being part of the solution by being here. So I appreciate the example that you're setting because people know that you're here other than you. And maybe you can encourage them to come and be part of the solution. And I hope you get a supervisor that's not full of problems. You and me both. <laughs> I don't want to go down that that discussion because that's a bad, discouraging, sad thing. Anyway, thank you, sir, for coming and speaking to us. Thank you. Karen, you report. Say, how do you follow Tom? <laughs> that's not hard. I don't know what to say about that. Um, so, Fallon, you mentioned the, uh, the crosswalk at Eagle Way and Rosemont Boulevard. I had the opportunity to be here early Tuesday morning meeting Joel so we could go to a water treatment plant in Mecca, California, and I noticed that it was a very, very busy intersection. Very busy. Um, there is a crosswalk, but and it was morning, so there was a, a crossing guard there, and she did help the students across the street. But I can see that it would be a problem, and so today I mentioned to uh, Mrs. Gaines that I would take it to the county uh, to see if we could do something. They'll probably want some sort of a traffic study. Mm -hmm. I don't like traffic studies because they don't really. That's why I'm watching. Yeah, exactly. Together. But um, so between um, mm -hmm. Superintendent Gaines and Joel and myself and whoever would like to chime in on it, mm -hmm. I'll take it to the county to ask them about that. Because I noticed that on Tuesday morning that it was a lot of traffic. And I can just imagine if there's not a crossing guard there, mm -hmm. how dangerous it could be for students. Um, Anyway, so we will have a new uh, county district two supervisor uh, with the November 5th election. This is what I've been saying to crowds that I've seen in the last couple of three weeks. I know most of you are probably registered to vote. I can imagine that you are, but you might know someone who is not, and the last day to register is October the 21st. So I can't endorse anyone, I can't paint, can't campaign for anyone, but I can ask you to please vote. And if you know of someone who needs to register to vote, please encourage them to do so, because it's just important. It's just important that we all participate, just like Assembly Women Mike says. We have to participate to make difference, and voting for most of us, that's the way we're gonna make difference. East County normally gets, so if you want somebody that will pay attention to East County. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I can't really, I can't endorse or campaign or suggest or anything like that because of my job. But I'm just hoping that whoever gets elected will say, okay, Karen, you and John and BJ can stay. So anyway, um, other than that, the county departments have been hard at work. There have been some complaints sent to code compliance and to public works, and they've all picked up the mantle and done done their due diligence and, and cleaned up sidewalks and um, there are road projects that are in the works um, it, it all has to do with contractors and time and I can't explain it I apologize for that but there they are being paid attention to the parks uh, situation here is being paid attention to um, costs have increased crazily um, a splash pad now costs $2 million, whereas before it was like $400,000. And so the county's having to shuffle some funds to make that happen for certain areas. But again, they're kind of postponing some things, just waiting for a new uh, supervisor for District 2. So anyway, other than that, it's good to see you all. Thank you. Dear. I'll be back. Slip and slides are cheap, you know. Slip and, sli <laughs> slip and slides are cheap. Jack Chamber. <coughs> Yep, been a busy week. A lot of activity going on with the chamber. I'm Jack Miller, Vice President. Um, 
biggest thing we got coming up really is our uh, December 7th Christmas Parade of Lights, which will also be a vendor fair. We'll be shut down part of the street. And also we're still gonna have the Sands Village. And in the Sands Village, other than things for the, the kids to do, we're gonna have the toy giveaway, food giveaway, and clothing giveaway. And we've got a lot of people working on that. We had such an overwhelming response last year. Uh, our, budget, our goal this year is to raise $10,000 in toys. Um, in addition to that, because we ran out of like this, and there was a line, what, almost a block and a half down the street waiting to get in. And we ran out of toys in about two, three hours. And uh, that was six, seven thousand dollars in toys. This year, we're taking a different approach. We're doing pre registration online for the Roseman residents only can pre register. So we want the toys first to go to all the Roseman residents. They put in the ages and the names of the kids so that when we go to buy a gift, we can do some analysis and see what age groups and how many gifts we need in those age groups. And the Roseman kids that pre register will get their gifts first. And then, as far as the food and the clothing, anybody that comes in can pick that up. Last year we had pallets and pallets of food and clothing uh, donated for the event. So we're really looking forward to this year. We're just getting ready to get the sponsorships out. All the sponsorship and money will go strictly to that event. Versus the Armed Forces Day and other events helps cover the infrastructure structure of the chamber for the year. So that, that we're looking forward to. That's a big event. It's gonna take a lot of volunteers. Um, Marshall and other people like him to help us with it. <coughs> Secondly, um, last night we had the District 2 uh, forum at Guido's that was hosted by the Chamber. Uh, we did not uh, favor any political party. We just wanted this opportunity for the community to meet all the candidates, ask questions, and do a little bit of a debate forum as well. Great form, turnout could have been better. Like you were talking earlier, you know, this is a good turnout, but it should be packed, it should be this whole room. And kind of the same thing with that form. Everybody that complains, and they're not there to meet their candidates. So, you know, how do you really know who to choose? There are some great candidates there. Personally, just my personal opinion, I felt two candidates, I'm not gonna say who, were very qualified for the position. I think they were sincere to help our community. And I'll just deal with that on my part. Um, we did have two people leave the board of the chamber uh, for personal reasons. And today we appointed uh, Heather Rodriguez of Grocery Outlet. She's going to be on the board as treasurer. And then we have Shauna Downs, who's been doing all her events for us. We brought her in as director as well. Uh, January, Eric Landsgard will be resigning for personal reasons. Again, we're really busy. He's got four stores to run. He just doesn't have time. So we have an open position there. I know Marshall's interested in that. And Marshall does a lot of great stuff for the community, so we really appreciate what you do for the youth. And then in January, I'm selling my house, retiring, moving on board. So in our, uh, probably April or May, the next election cycle. And, uh, there'll be a position to use well. Um, I think that's everything. Do you anything? No, I don't think so. Okay, that's it. Anybody have any questions? Yes? Is there going to be any other form, or that's the only form as far as the candidates are concerned? As far as the chamber's involved, that was it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're, to get that date, uh, calling all six of them and yeah. getting all their dates to line up, then their schedule was packed from now until November 5th. So we got lucky that uh, we were able to get them down last night when we did. Um, and there was some really good questions to the candidates, too. Was it, did anyone record it before we can kind of? Yes. Yes, we had somebody recorded. We're working on getting on, on the recording as well. So we should see it out uh, on the internet pretty soon. Thank you. Yep, yep. Thank you. And I could encourage everybody to watch as many of those videos as you can. Make up your mind who you want to vote for. All right. Thank you. All right. Barbara. Southern Kern High School District. Keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> Do a few things. 
Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a little update on Southern Kern Unified School District. Um, we have been in the construction business like crazy for the past few years. Uh, we finally finished Tropico Middle School, um, 28 new classrooms, seven new buildings. A lot of you were there to attend that ribbon cutting. We are in the process of finishing up a brand new cafeteria at Roseman High. Um, it's, it's really going to be beautiful and at the same time we are our architects are working on uh, building a high and we're uh, we're gutting the current locker room there and we're going to convert the old locker room the the boy side of it will become the new weight room and the girl side of it will become a new dance studio so those are three additional projects that we're doing at Roseman High. We are uh, modernizing a couple of the buildings at Roseman Elementary School, the older part of Roseman Elementary for after school programs. We, we will uh, bring in STEM labs at both Roseman Elementary and West Park Elementary for students to extend our day up to the nine hours to be able to provide engaging activities for our kids up to perhaps 6 p.m. And uh, so we're modernizing six classrooms of the old campus with hopefully a goal next year of having additional funds that we could finish the old Roseman Elementary campus. But we know we need that for our kids to be able to have space where they can actively engage with robotics and STEM, um, STEM labs. So that's a couple other things. We're in DSA at West Park Elementary for five new buildings, 10 new classrooms. Um, we're just waiting to get DSA approval on that. And then we will- Everyone what DSA stands for? Department of State Architect. Thank you. No thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so we have a lot currently going on uh, right now at, at, in Southern Kern. I also, uh, like Karen mentioned, uh, we have Measure H on the ballot. I'm not here to encourage you either way about Measure H, but I would like to ask you if you have questions about Measure H, uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to try to answer your questions. Measure H is a, a $60 million bond that Southern Kern has on the ballot. You might ask yourself, well, why? As I just heard you talk about all this construction, um, I can tell you that West Park Elementary is at a thousand students. The classes, the 10 classrooms that we're going to build, we're going to demolish 10 portables. We're going to remove 10 portables, I should say, not demolish. And so we're really, it's just kind of uh, putting new classrooms to get rid of portables. Um, we recently purchased 20 acres on the west side of um, uh, Roseman High School. It's in between Roseman High School and Tropico Middle School. It's right on Roseman Boulevard. It's facing south, so it's on the same side as the high school. And we bought that for future use. One thing that we know, I, I met with Edwards Air Force Base this past week. They have a new contract coming in, I was told, that they predict will bring in 2,000 jobs, not to mention all the other new new uh, businesses that are coming in between Roseman, Mojave, et cetera. So uh, it's, I don't know if all of those families would have even one child, Southern Kern Unified School District would be in really, really bad shape. And uh, our high school is, uh, Gretchen, please correct me, 60 years old this January or December? Mm -hmm. 1966. 1966. So, I can't tell you everything that is needed on that high school. An HVAC unit, I just recently put in three. They were $30,000 each for the unit and the labor. And uh, at the high school, we need so much. Our classrooms were maxed out of classrooms. We, we, we have a lot of great things going on at Roseman High. We have 12 CTE pathways. There are districts down 14 that are coming to Rosemont to visit our pathways because they, they're like, wow, 12. And so we, we, we need to really 
CTE's uh, career technical education. Thank you, sir. What would I do without you? <laughs> thank you. I've known him for a long, long time. <laughs> um, he was once actually my boss. But anyway, um, um, CTE, career technical education, we have 12 pathways, and we're very proud of those pathways because we know not all kids are going to go to college. So, and Rosemont High is also a college going campus. You can take high school classes while taking college classes there, but we need space. We need to modernize that campus. So just wanted to throw it out there. If anybody has any questions about Measure H, please ask me. If not, not yes, sir. directly about H, but how is Southern Kern done in rating students for reading and math? Thank you. I love that question. Uh, we know we're just waiting for the for the data to not be embargoed, so I can release it. Uh, here's what we know: Southern Kern went up in math scores. We went up in our English language arts scores. We went down in suspensions, and we went down in chronic absenteeism. So we're we're anxiously awaiting for the state to release those, those scores. And we recently were, received an email that we had to upload. This is a small thing, but this one tickled me to death. We had to upload this data. And I got this, got this email from California Department of Education. We were the only district, and keep in mind, Southern Kern compared to some of the districts in Bakersfield, some of those districts are huge. We have 3,700 kids. We're six schools, 3,700. So we're not a big district, but we were the only district in the state that uploaded the data correctly. So I thought, wow, that speaks volumes, not for me, but for my people who, uh, we have a great IT team. So yeah, so we're, we're, doing, we're doing well. Plenty of room to grow, for sure, but we're doing it. We're bringing in some top-notch people to work with our teachers, to work with our administrators. We had 50 some teachers at Rosemont Elementary Saturday um, uh, receiving professional development by Dr. Doug Fisher. He's <coughs> author of many books, uh, uh, focuses on teacher clarity and making sure that what we're teaching is rigorous and standards-based. So um, yeah, we're, we're putting everything we, we can in place and we've got some Amazing kids at Roseman. What Absolutely do you amazing. To less suspension and stuff too. Well, well, we have a we have a uh, right. a really good mental health team uh, in in Southern Kern. We also have now at our secondary, middle school, and high school alternative to suspension room. So in, in, instead of immediately thinking, okay, you're going home, which is exactly where they want to go, yay, I can get on the, uh, play the games and do everything, send me home. If I do this again tomorrow, do I get to go home again tomorrow? So we're now sending them to the alternative to suspension room where we have a teacher in there who makes them do the work. They're in there and they have to do the work. They don't get to go out during passing period and, and, and uh, enjoy you know social time with their friends. So we believe that is helping. That's Sam a good also. Program, right? Yeah. So yeah. So we we believe that is what's helping us. Can I ask you a question? Sure. A, lot, a lot of the districts in my my area are rural districts. And they're experiencing declining enrollment. I, I think a lot of that's going to reverse because of affordability. I think people are going to start looking closer, but a lot of those people are troubled people, by the way. Um, but nonetheless, are you guys in declining enrollment out here, or are you <laughs> doing just the opposite? We are doing the opposite. So I mean, that's good to yeah. hear, but that's also a different problem. It is a different problem, and uh, thus we, we purchased the 20 acres. We, we saw that uh, that land come up and we thought oh well this is this is a great parcel for future um, whether it'll be in my tenure as superintendent I don't know but uh, down the road that would definitely be a location for potentially a third elementary school which is I what I see us really really needing right now oh well, surprise Rosemont High sits on 50 some acres of land it's hard to believe but when you start walking back there and look at all the fields. It, it's, it's rather huge back there. So 
but we need to do a lot of work in our buildings, that's for sure. A lot of work. Well, in my opinion, Superintendent Gaines has done more for our schools than anybody I ever before. Oh, You're so kind, Jack. Yeah, like I work with our Hondo School District back several years back. Thank you. We experienced really serious problems in those days, too. We went from exponential growth where we had to change calendar completely and it was very unpopular to be on the school board at that time by the way a b c and d e and x y and z remember we went from explosion then we went to reductions in force which x. meant uh declining enrollment which meant yeah. reductions in force which means layoffs yeah. that was terrible too yeah, yeah. assemblyman lackey was a great board member he was being very humble he was a phenomenal board member for palmdale years Years ago. Very difficult. <laughs> thank you, Miss Gaines. Thank you. Uh, Rick, uh, RCSC, do you guys have anything? Oh, uh, the box started coughing. I apologize. <laughs> I was all of a sudden <laughs> chuckling real bad. But anyway, I went to the assembly room. That's why I showed up. So, uh, the biggest thing with the district, we have the uh, three seats, I mean, two seats up. Uh, and they're running. We have three real qualified candidates, so don't forget to vote for them. District's doing good as far as our projects. There's no really good projects coming. I will tell and ask everyone for their eyes on this one. There's still a water from our fire hydrants. They are actually some of the more remote locations. They're, they're still in water. I don't know the exact water amount, but it's up in the 100,000 gallon amount. So if you see someone out there, that you know is not an RCSP employee, you don't have to confront them. At least call it the district, don't be caught. Remember, folks, we're all paying for that water there. Uh, and they're actually, I think the general manager made a uh, comment at one meeting, we're talking north of 400,000 gallons. And I remember several years back, they were doing it to uh, irrigate the marijuana groves. Could be doing that again or whatnot, but that's a lot of water, folks. So if you see folks out there looking up to it, it's not your job to confront them. Let the sheriff's department know, see what you know, they go out there and investigate it. But at least call the district and say mm -hmm. that at this site here, you saw this here because you get 400,000 gallons of water at this point, that's a whole bunch of water, folks. So that's, that's our water. But anyway, outside of that, the elections, that's about what we have. I will let everyone know one thing. You, uh, Few weeks ago, we were out at Edward Air Force Base for a museum tour, and that committee out there put a lot of effort into that to get it right for the community. I'd ask you if you get out there to support them and whatnot, and that's, that's about what we have to work with. Yeah, and if you see something like that happen, my suggestion is be a little bit secretive, but <clears throat> capture it on your camera. Everybody carries a camera now. And uh, that's very smart. And that way you don't confront anybody, but you got the evidence and you can share it. And it's, it's a wise way to go. I appreciate everybody. We have a very important meeting coming up that we can't be, we, we, we got to pack the room. It's an SB 1383. They're revisiting that on October 24th at 530 here at Hummel Hall. It's a state mandate that they're not giving the counties any funding to, to it's basically organic waste separating keeping the gas levels down in the uh, disposal. And they're looking at putting it on our property taxes. So, very important we pack the room. The county lets the board know that, hey, maybe 10 people showed up, we can basically do what we want. They're not gonna fight us. If we pack that room and it's standing room only, word will get back that, hey, they're serious. They don't want this. We, might, we need to look at other solutions on that. So, get the word out, plan on attending. Uh, this meeting, it's here at Hummel Hall, uh, October 24th at 5.30. So, uh, very important. It's probably one of the most important meetings um, towards the end of this year that uh, affects our community. So, I encourage everybody to get the word out. I wanted to add something too. Just with voting, please register to vote. If you're not registered, spread the word. And for anything that has to do with our community, whether it's a bond, whether it's a, a, a district supervisor, anything that affects our community, please get the facts. Everybody appreciates if you come and ask a question, just like Mrs. Gaines was saying, like if you, if you have a question that's directly related to the bond, ask. 
I get the facts. Don't sit on Facebook or go online and listen to what everybody says because everybody's got an opinion. But please remember an opinion is not a fact. And if you want to know more about funding or about any of that, go to a school board meeting, you will hear it. I can tell you just firsthand, being somebody who grew up here, I went to these schools, I walk on campuses every day, and there are some much, much needed things and our student population is thriving. And then a big part of my job is to be a part because we have the community schools grant. I go to Kern County, I go to other, you know, everywhere in Kern County, I meet with other districts. I'm in communication with multiple districts in Kern County. And in a meeting recently, one of the biggest things I realized is the amount that Mrs. Gaines has done for our district and the amount of things that our teachers and our staff and all the work we've put in, they deserve, obviously the students first, but our staff also deserves to teach in an environment that's not hot and having to worry about HVAC units and all of these things and not enough space. But I go to these meetings and I meet with other districts and this recent meeting I was in, everybody's question was, we need help with chronic absenteeism. Well, we're doing really well regarding chronic absenteeism because it's still a thing, even though we don't really talk about the C word anymore, but you know, COVID still, those effects are still trickling down. Southern Kern is, is thriving as far as our student population and you know the programs that we have and all these wonderful things going on. But those students and the staff deserve to have a safe, comfortable space. They deserve the space, just in general. So just putting that out there, make sure you vote. And if you have questions, contact somebody at the school district, if it's about the bond, if it's about anything else, watch the interactions that you see and watch the debates, make an informed decision. No, just what, uh, yes. what Assemblyman Lackey said, uh, thank you for being part of the solution mm -hmm. and being here, as always. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank appreciate you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir.